Welcome back, everybody. When Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte was elected into office in 2016, a fatal war on drugs was waged. And with that, also a war on democracy, a war on press freedom as well. Well, our next guest is a journalist who is on the front lines of that war, and she is currently facing prison time for her attempts to get that truth out to the public. She is the co-founder of news organization Raffler. She was also named Times Person of the Year in 2018, and she was recognized as one of the 100 most influential people in the world last year. She is also at the center of a brand new documentary entitled A Thousand Cuts. It is our honor and our pleasure to welcome all the way from the Philippines, the one and only Maria Ressa. Welcome to the show, Maria. Thanks for having me, Mel and Jess. Now, during this years long war against drugs, Duterte has repeatedly threatened uh, drug dealers and users uh, with death. And the Philippine police have admitted to killing between 6,000 and 8,000 uh, people. But human rights groups put that number closer to 27,000. So we want to know what is it like day to day for the people who are living through this right now? It's normalization of violence. You know, this is one yeah. of the things that most shocked me. And and this has not been going on for a year. It's been going on for four years, right? Uh, and, you know, one of the things that truly shocked me was to hear Filipinos say it's okay to kill. Accept that that is, you know, a price you are willing to pay to be safe, right? This is taking us against them to the nth degree. So the, uh, you know, millions and millions of uh, Filipinos were put into lockdown again last month, but uh, those are now slowly starting to ease. But where has the pandemic um, exacerbated that situation that you just discussed? I think on three fronts, you know, so so first we are in our 26th week of lockdown. The Philippines is in the world's lo longest lockdown, that's one. And then the second is, like Brazil, we are very security driven. Uh, Bolsonaro and Duterte both appointed former military generals to head a response to a virus, right? So that's that's happened. And, and, and I'll tell you two things in that one. Um, since the lockdown began in March, uh, more than 100,000 people have been arrested. Uh, President Duterte on April 1 actually said, uh, everybody follow these quarantine rules, or ah, then he told the police this, he said, shoot them dead. That's a direct quote. And the very next day, a 63 year old farmer was shot and killed because he, weren't, he wasn't wearing a mask, but that's one. The second is, so there's greater fear. Uh, you, you're stuck in your homes. Uh, we have curfews at the worst instance, you need to have a quarantine pass to leave your home. And then finally, and this is, I think, not you, you, it, in many ways, this is bigger than what is happening to me, but hasn't gotten as much attention. Our largest broadcaster, ABS-CBN, has been shut down. Now, the, the title of this documentary, Thousand Cuts, refers, of course, to the multitude of cuts that are being made to democracy and freedom of the press in the Philippines. Now, based on your last answer, I have no idea how you're going to answer this. But <sighs> in this moment, do you see democracy as dying or as dead already? I think we're fighting. I think the next few months will be critical. I think what happens with the U.S. elections will be critical. I'm the cautionary tale for journalism, but the first person attacked was a businessman and he had a publicly listed company. And when the president attacked that on nationwide television in 2016, his shares collapsed and his company was was bought, right? There's a politician, uh, Senator Lila de Lima. She's the cautionary tale. She investigated Mayor Duterte for human rights violations. She was very vocal and she's been in prison since 2017. So it's more than three years that our Senator has been in prison without really any formal, few formal hearings. That's the goal, right? Violence and fear, be afraid don't speak up because if you do this is what's going to happen to you um we're fighting you know I, I my conviction on june 15 shows me that my runway is is a little shorter than i'm i would like it to be but yeah i think whether i go to jail or not will depend on how well i battle how well i fight for yeah. the freedom that is guaranteed in the constitution
Maria, tell us why, for those who think that this is just an isolated problem of press freedom in the Philippines, explain why this is actually a much more global concern. Our problem in the Philippines won't be solved by Filipinos alone because the very beginning of it, which is how you get rid of facts, how you create alternate realities, these this came from Silicon Valley decisions. Look, the world's largest distributor of news is Facebook. That's that's documented, right? And they pulled together almost two point in their second quarter results. They said it's two point seven billion ac accounts, right? That's a big chunk of society. So they cut right across. In the old days, we all had vertical media verticals in each country, but now it the social media platforms cut across all of our countries and they unite us for good and evil. <laughs> and I would say in the last yeah. few years, we have been winning, frankly, is insidious manipulation at a scale that we are, we as people are defenseless against. So that is happening to you. Yes. Wow. Th this weaponization of, of the internet as, as you, dig into in the documentary. And you say that the very design and structure of social media is illiberal. Is there any reversing this? So, you know, Rappler continues to be a partner of Facebook because I do think that uh, it is impossible to put the genie back in the bottle. Technology is here and we need to find a way to, to make it friendly to democracy. What can we do? The first is to demand greater transparency uh, from the social media platforms. The second is to demand that enlightened self-interest. Move fast, break things, work for a period of time, but when you break democracy, I hope that that makes you stop and think and not be so greedy. For me, the essential one is why not give up micro-targeting? It is so insidiously manipulative that, you know, you, you even bring up questions of whether or not we have free will. If we are being manipulated behind the scenes, the lies that are that are seeded spread faster and further than facts. I, I would mm -hmm. say, now I go as far as saying that um, the social media platforms are biased against facts and they're biased against mm -hmm. journalists. A problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Wow. Let, can we follow that? Because of all of your reporting, you are one of the top targets of the Duterte government. You are facing multiple cases in court. You've already been convicted of cyber libel in one of those cases, facing up to six years in prison. Where do you stand right now with relation to the courts? It's hard to tell because, again, on the 26th week of a lockdown, um, we're fighting the court cases. The only Time, most of the time, the only time I leave this house is to actually go to court. Uh, and even then, you know, our my last arraignment was July 22 for another tax evasion case. And, uh, and we walked into the courtroom a week or so after people died in that courthouse. So demanding that we appear physically in court, it's funny, it's like double jeopardy, you know, uh, get your rights uh, trampled on and at the same time you could get COVID. You know? So there are three broad buckets of cases. The first cyber libel, you know where that is. The second tax evasion. And then the third is um, the mother case. It's securities fraud. This is foreign ownership. I mean, the reason we set up Rappler, Rappler is a startup. And the reason we set it up is because we wanted independence. That was the dream of Rappler. So it's kind of ironic. So in light of uh, the multiple lawsuits, the threat to your livelihood and the, the threats to your, to your life, you have said in the film that you need to accept and prepare yourself for sort of the worst case scenario. So where, Maria, do you draw the line between resignation and realism? And how does that impact your process as a journalist? When the government tries to hang a Damocles sword over you, if you change the way you work, they win. And so the, the challenge for us, for me personally and for our organization is, how do we protect ourselves and our people in, in this environment? And so for me, what we did is, worst case scenario, workflow drill. I guess the one thing I don't want to be is like the frog in boiling water. But frankly, I don't know when to jump out because this it's a game of intimidation because 
the future will be determined by what you do now. And you don't want to ever voluntarily give up your rights. You're not going to say, oh, I'm, well, this is why I try to control my fear. Because it's not that I'm not afraid. It's that I know what's at stake, right? So I'm not going to voluntarily, because they want to make me a cautionary tale. I'm going to fight. I only get emotional when it's about Rappler. um, Because they're incredible. The mission is critical. I can see that. I can see that. And that's the thing when you, when the going gets tough, what is it that you say to them to keep them pushing? Because like Jess yeah. mentioned, this is, it's not just like, it's a bad day at the office. This is like <laughs> lives on the line, your safety on the line. I, I say more than that. I think, I think it's our democracy on the line. It's our rights on the line. And the atmosphere of fear is very real, right? You started, we started out by talking about deaths. Uh, in, in June of 2016, in July 2016, our reporter, Patricia, she, we only can afford to put one on the night shift. She would come home and her, her cameraman, they would come home every night with an average of eight dead bodies. That's when we knew something bad was really happening. Eight dead bodies on the sidewalks. Um, so what do we, it, it, I, I think we know what's at stake. What's at stake is Philippine democracy. And I think we're not going to let it go. You know, how can not just international governments, but international supporters, how can we help the Philippines to defend human rights and press freedom? What can we do? Uh, so first the, at the UN general assembly, like, you know, human rights, Stand up for the values. And I got to say again, Canada has been doing that. You're one of the few countries. In fact, you may be the first country to really stand up for press freedom. If we don't stand up for the values of democracy, for the values of human rights, what do we stand for? Right? So so that's one. And I think the second thing is I've learned that when times are really bad, your community gathers around you. I think this is another time for civil society to, to try to, create what civic engagement looks like in the age of social media. And then I guess the last part, and this is for Rappler, you know, the way we've survived this is our legal fees, which have been exponential. Um, We spend almost $40,000 a month on legal fees. That's a lot for little Rappler, right? Uh, It's crowdfunding. We survive because of the kindness of strangers. Maria, we are going to wish you the very, very best. I know your mountain that you're climbing uh, sometimes seems like it continues to grow taller and taller, but uh, the fact that you're here now to share your story, we deeply, deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We want to let everybody know that you can screen A Thousand Cuts virtually today. Head to a thousandcuts.film and also you will find a participating theater near you. And uh, we will be right back after this. 